Ilovaisk, a small town east of Donetsk, was hit hard by last summer's battles. Now the roofs of its public buildings are being repaired by Ukrainian prisoners of war. Come on, guys, easy. They were captured sometime in August. Hey, when was it exactly you got captured? August the 29th. On the 29th of August, they were captured. Until the 29th of August, it looked as though Ukraine might crush the separatist Donetsk People's Republic, or DPR. But then, here in Ilovaisk, with Russian help, the rebels scored a decisive victory. Hundreds of Ukrainians were killed and hundreds more taken prisoner. Like these men, marched daily from the barracks to their place of work and back. For me, they're Ukrainian nationalists and fascists. But the ones here are decent people. They've just been misled by the Kiev regime. Donetsk separatists have managed to convince many local people that the elected pro-Western Kiev government is in fact a fascist junta. Now they want to convince the world to recognize their independence. Here, the DPR foreign minister, Alexander Kofman, is bringing a delegation from the breakaway Georgian region of Abkhazia to meet Donetsk's head of state, Alexander Zaharchenko, the man in the blue jersey. Though they are themselves pro-Russian, Abkhazia's leaders have yet to recognize Donetsk as independent. Will there be a press conference after the talks? Yes, of course. But after the meeting, Kofman faced journalists alone and dodged questions about recognition. It's better to report after the fact. There's no need to speak about the process. I'll talk about their recognizing us only when it's a done deal. To Ukraine, the DPR is nothing more than a terrorist organization. But it sees itself as a state, complete with flag, car number plates and popular support. People here tend to blame everything from the war to the fact that cash points aren't working on Kiev alone. At this downtown bar, poets capture the mood. This poet, Igor Maslov, also leads one of the DPR's combat units. What does Holy Russia bring us? Our ancestors, our roots. Sviatoslav the brave. What does Europe bring us? See for yourselves. Gay parades, lesbianism, and who is behind all this? The Americans. Americans. Maslov's illustrated epic about Maidan as he saw it was presented by the DPR leadership to Russian movie star Ivan Oklobistin in Donetsk for a morale-boosting premiere. It's tough for the people here. We can warm people's souls. People should understand that they're together and together with Russia. Foreign Minister Kofman looked on approvingly. He says that Russia, including the Russian creative intelligentsia, fully supports us. Not only the intelligentsia, but the whole of Russian society. Do you hear? He's saying children in Russia play at being the heroes of our war. Listen, it's very interesting. Actually, Russia does not officially recognize the DPR, though it does covertly support its armed forces. Even Kaufman sometimes forgets the Republic exists. Hello. No, I'm in Ukraine. Oh, God, I mean in the DPR. Gaffs aside, though, Kaufman says he has great faith in the new state. It is the first state in the 23 years since the destruction of the Soviet Union that gives people the hope of a normal and honest existence. Despite the nostalgia for the USSR, the Donbass region's Soviet heritage has become a problem. Much of its industry and coal mines remain state-owned and inefficient. They're dependent on subsidies. And since the pro-Russians seized control of the sites and refused to pay any taxes, Kiev has stopped paying. How to put it? We are mining industry volunteers. <laughs> At the Chaluskinsev mine, southwest of Donetsk, 
No one's had their salary since September. Right now, I have no money. Do you understand? <laughs> money is not the only problem. Luda, bring them up. The ones from the other pit are going to come out this way now. These miners had to travel five kilometers underground. They could not come out of the mine's other pit because a missile hit the head frame. As they head home, a repair team is at the other side, five kilometers nearer the front line. Look, there was the first hit, and there was the second one. In any case, it's not possible to use those cables to bring people up anymore. They're too badly damaged. The rocket was fired from Ukrainian-held territory. I don't know why they fire at mines. Maybe just because they're easy targets. It's high and big. See it in your visor? Great. Bam. This way, right? Yes, Pavel Petrovich. No one was hurt in this attack, but Pavel and his team don't know how they'll get the money and materials to repair the damage. Inside, electricians are trying to restore the power supply. All unpaid. Coal is needed in winter for the heating systems and power stations. Every day we're supplying heat for kindergartens, for schools. The city would freeze if we didn't. Everyone would freeze. Kiev has also stopped pension payments to retirees in separatist-run areas. Maria Olinik is all the more bitter about that, since she is actually a Ukrainian patriot. As such, today she lives a semi-clandestine existence and reads the separatist newspapers ruefully. You need to know your enemy. You need to know their point of view. And here there's something about their plans, their ideas. Last spring, Maria helped organize demonstrations for Ukrainian unity in Donetsk. Until violence put an end to them. That was the last pro-European demonstration. You can see here how many people are being beaten. At that demonstration, the police showed their true face. They were on the pro-Russian side. Since then, almost all Maria's fellow activists have fled the city or disappeared. I'm afraid. I'm very afraid for myself and for everyone else. The Donetsk People's Republic is developing its own legal code based on the Soviet model. Promotion of Ukrainian ideas is considered a crime. Displaying the symbols of the Ukrainian state indicates allegiance to the enemy. How would a true Frenchman react, for example, if someone was walking down the street with a fascist German flag, with a swastika on? I don't need an answer. Listen to that. What's that? An explosion in the city center. The shellfire is loudest in the northern suburbs of Donetsk, near the airport. Buildings in this area have been severely damaged. Pavel, the engineer from the mine, lives here. All the windows in this building are broken. Look, here's my complete set of windows, cellophane. I have to keep the whole roll because it keeps getting ripped again and again. There is one down there that came off yesterday. The water hasn't frozen yet. That means the heating was only cut off yesterday. It hasn't had time to freeze. But they won't repair it today because there's fighting going on, shooting. Let's see here. Nope, no gas at all. I think even if I don't get paid for a year, it won't affect my family too badly.
We won't starve or freeze, and surely all this will be over in a year, one way or another. It's harder, of course, for those who don't have any savings. Such people are to be counted in the millions. They include Maria, heading out with her neighbour for the second time now to collect food parcels. There are queues for humanitarian aid all over Donetsk. Please, everybody, step back, make way. This cargo is from local billionaire Renat Akhmetov's charity. In a sense, it's humiliating, of course, but it is really a lifeline to all of us. We're not getting our pensions anymore. We need five more men. Who wants to help? Most of those waiting for hours in sub-zero temperatures refuse to blame the separatists for their plight. It's America destroying us. And the Ukrainian president who has sold out to America. That's what we think. Maria thinks differently, but knows better than to say so in public. What's America got to do with anything? But that lady would kill me if I contradicted her. You understand? Since April, Ukrainian media have been cut off here. What she is saying is just a message Russian television churns out every day. After three hours in the cold, Maria is finally served. The Akhmetov Foundation says it has delivered more than 2 million 13 kilo bags of aid to Donbass residents since August. Summer, my favorite, Sprats. With the separatists insisting that they want to take over more territory but simply can't afford to pay everyone's pension, a humanitarian crisis looms.